Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of Jill on Money, we're talking about how to make you a better manager. A manager should be a leader, should be seen as a leader in order to be successful. But management is a role. It can be given to you. It can be taken away from you. Whereas leadership is something you have to earn. You know, if people don't want to follow you, then you're not successfully being a leader. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. I am your host, Jill Schlesinger. And today we've got a really interesting guest. Her name is Julie Zhu. So she is VP of product design at Facebook, but she's here joining us today as an author. The book is called The Making of a Manager. Julie recounts her transition from a worker to a manager, what she learned, her foibles, the upside, the downside. And of course, I couldn't help myself. I had to ask her a few questions about Facebook and what's going on, this craziness around this company. But I think what is perhaps most relatable is how hard it is sometimes to transition to a different role in the same company. So here's our interview with Julie Zhu. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Julie Zhu, welcome to the program. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Jill. Uh, We start our program with one very important question. I have a feeling which way you're going to go with this, but maybe I'm wrong. We like to ask, what is the best career or investment or financial decision you've ever made? The best. Joining Facebook, a startup at the time that was a college site, back in 2006. That's a pretty good one. So you were there through the IPO. You're a gazillionaire now, essentially, right? I've been very lucky to work at a company uh, that's scaled and grown very rapidly. That it's is such a ride. nice... You see, I, I this is why I would never be part of that company, because I'd be like, yeah, baby, I'm rolling in it. I'm feeling good. But you work your butt off, right? Mm-hmm. And you've written a new book called The Making of a Manager because you had nothing else to do with your free time except write. Why did you write this book? You are basically your post-IPO cash lady, working hard. Why did you put this on top of everything else you're doing? The thing that helps me think the most, honestly, is writing. I've always been that person. I've had journals since I was 10 years old. So this was a practice for me to, you know, make sense of what was going on in my job. All of the problems I was going through, all of the struggles I was going through, it really helped me to put it on paper. Mm. And one day I just decided, you know, maybe other people might find some connection to these struggles that I was going through. So let's go back to your 10-year-old self. Where were you? Where where were you, where did you grow up? I grew up in Shanghai mm-hmm. until the age of six. I moved over to the United States. My parents had just finished college at the University of Louisiana. And uh, we moved to Houston. That's where I lived until college. I was just talking about Shanghai, and I said it's one of my favorite cities that I've ever visited. I just, I found it so incredibly enchanting. And I was trying to come up with a good analogy. Maybe you can help me with it, because I said, well, you know, when you go to Hong Kong, Hong Kong's sort of like London and New York. And when you go to Beijing, it's sort of like Washington, D.C., like the the capital city. How would you describe Shanghai to somebody? Because it feels like magical there. That's a great question. It's a little bit like New York, but, you know, I think it's utterly unique. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because it feels like a gateway between um, various aspects of China. Mm -hmm. But it also feels very reminiscent of old Europe because of the development, yes, right. right? The French procession. Yeah, it, beautiful old buildings. I loved it there. Do you get back or no? I do. I go back every year. I love it. I love it there. And also, like, kind of like a cool, like, weird underground music scene that was fantastic. Okay, this is not a Shanghai commercial. I just <laughs> wanted to say that I was I was thinking about that because that just came up. So I was trying to think of, like, the the analogy to Shanghai. And there is none. Is yeah. what we're finding. I think out. there is one. Okay. I think you just got to go and experience the city for yourself. All right. So you're in Texas, in Houston. You little little Julie writing in her journal, being super smart, great student always, right? Like first generation achiever, right? Oh yeah. Come tiger parents. Very really? much. Very. You know, much like got to get straight A's. You got to be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. Okay. And so you said, why no doctor? I'm afraid of blood. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's out. Lawyer. 
Was that in the running for a while? It never was because I just found law techs extremely boring. Mm. Okay. So engineer, you decide that you... Uh, that about- was my way of rebelling. I was like, no doctor, oh, no lawyer. Oh, yeah. My mom's first and second choice. Uh-huh. She was dying to have a doctor in the family. Oh. Doesn't every mother want that? She wanted someone. You know, when she, she had flu or stomach illness, she wanted someone to be able to call up. And I do think that's extremely pragmatic to have in your family. That's a very good thing. Probably much more so than, than an engineer. Mm-hmm. Although, maybe in technology age it's good to have an engineer oh yeah I think te- I think engineer is really up there I mean you have cable problems you don't know how to get on the internet <laughs> it is very helpful to have an engineer in your home so you attended Stanford mm-hmm. once you get to Stanford how do you decide what your discipline's going to be so again I go back to Asian parents three choices doctor lawyer engineer okay so I throughout high school I had already nixed the other two so I figured I should you know uh, understand if I was interested in this whole engineering thing and I took a few computer science classes I really really enjoyed them Uh, my seventh grade teacher was the one who introduced me to HTML the internet and how to put together a web page I still remember you know Wednesday afternoon with her my best friend and I, you know, we were in her lab. We had stayed, and she was like, come on over. Let me show you this awesome thing. And she had typed, you know, A-H-R-E-F equals some website at the time. And she reloaded the page, and the link just worked. And it seemed so easy, and it seemed so magical. And that was how we got started, you know, falling in love with just with code, basically. You come out of Stanford. And I presume, what year did you graduate? We are, we're like in 2000-ish? 2006. Okay. 2006, you come out. What do you know about the Facebook at that time? So I do a lot because the Facebook came out in 2004 at Stanford. It was a college site at the time. Mm-hmm. It was a new way for students to you know, connect online and see who was in their dorm, who was in their school, what music those people like to listen to, you know, where they came from, what were their hobbies. They had this awesome feature called The Wall, which basically became the digital equivalent of the whiteboard that Mm -hmm. you have on your friend's, you know, dorm room. And, you know, you're you're passing by, you scroll a message, you say, hey, I was here. And now you could do that online. So everyone in college was obsessed with the Facebook. Okay. So So that's good for background. So then when you come out of school, you go to them or do they recruit at Stanford? They recruited at Stanford and I had a great friend who had just joined the Facebook. And at the time I was looking for an internship. You know, I had I was taking a class about entrepreneurship and one of the, you know, things you're supposed to do when you take this class, it's like a nine month class, is do an internship with a startup Mm -hmm. so that you could really experience what it was like. You know, you can put them to practice all the things that we had been learning, case studies about startups that had succeeded or failed. And my friend was like, you should come to the Facebook. It's a startup. I mean, we're still, you know, in the early stages of things. He's like, it's really fun. You know, it's a great group of people. Like, just come check it out. And so he convinced me to sign up the Facebook as my startup. Uh, It was a little uh, larger side of startups at the time. You know, So how many people were there when you start this internship? It was dozens, you know, enough that could fit into a backyard party. Okay, but less than 50. Probably a little more than 50. Okay. So somewhere between 50 and 100 people who are part of this company that is something you already understand. Mm -hmm. And what's the internship? The internship is a computer science internship. On my very first day... My mentor, you know, asked me, hey, what kind of, you know, code and software do you like to write? I told her I really like to write the front end. I like the parts uh, that where the users interacted with the interface. You know, I'd like to think about what to put in front of them and how, you know, they should uh, go through a particular flow. And she's like, oh, you want to design? I'll sit you down with the designers over here. And prior to then, I didn't know design was an actual profession. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, uh, you know, that that you could make a living out of determining, you know, what it is that people saw and what is their experience right. on a piece of software. Uh, but that's how I got to sitting with the designers. In the engineering slot, mm-hmm. let's say, what would the designer, who would that person be? Who, like, give me a, a way to explain that to the lay person, what that designer does, actually. Yeah. So the designer is designing the user interface. So, you know, you're interacting with a piece of software. Let's say you go to Facebook. Mm -hmm. You want to share that photo that you just took Mm -hmm. at Thanksgiving dinner. So how do we let you know 
how you upload a photo. You okay. know, where do you find the add photo button? When you tap it, you know, what should slide up? It's, you know, your, your and photo how, tray. And, and you want to understand from the mind of the person using the site how to make it seamless and make the experience a uh, frictionless one, right? Exactly. Okay. We, we want to make sure that the experience is clear. It's easy to understand. It's easy to use. So how long was the internship? It was three months, but halfway through, I decided to convert full time. Uh oh, big conversion! <laughs> I I I was like, I love this job. I love this group of people. I really believe in the company, and so you know, I know I've some classes left. I'm just going to finish that on the side and really dedicate myself full time to this job. So you now are a full time Facebook employee in somewhere in the middle of 2006, and for how long did you? Uh, work on that design team before you were asked to become a manager? I worked on the design team for three years mm-hmm. or so. And at that time, you know, we had we had been growing. You know, we added a few more designers to the team. And one day my manager sat me aside and said, hey, our team's growing. I really need someone to help me manage the team. You get along with everyone. How about it? She's nice. Let her do it. Okay. What was your impression of a management role or a manager's role as you understood it right before you became a manager? What, like if I talked to you a half an hour before that conversation took place, what would you tell me a manager does? I would have told you what it is I saw my own manager doing, which is running team meetings, hiring people, having one-on-ones with people, talking about, you know, what are you working on? Does it fit into what everyone else is working on? And what do you think, once you got this job, was your biggest misconception about the role of a manager? That I really didn't understand how a manager's success is evaluated. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought that it was all about, hey, are you doing right by your people? Do they like working for you? Do they feel supported by you? So in your book, I found this really interesting because you have a you kind of started with some of your emotions and you said about your new role that you had fear, doubt, and you wondered whether you were crazy for feeling this way. Mm -hmm. Is that a culture where you could share those feelings with anybody? I didn't share as much of those feelings with people at work. In retrospect, I think that was a mistake. I think if I had told my manager more of how I was feeling, you know, hey, I'm about to go and have this one-on-one, I don't really know if I'm prepared for mm-hmm. it, maybe let's talk about it. Maybe you give me some advice. You know, I felt like I asked her a lot of questions, but I wasn't as direct with her about how I truly felt. Because it's kind of exposing to go there, right? Absolutely. And I wanted her to think that she didn't misplace her faith in me by making me, you know, a manager. Oh, what do we do with that? Julie, darn it, a big mistake. <sighs> um, you say that the job of manager is, quote, to get better outcomes from a group of people working together. That's it. You just mm-hmm. synthesize it. I thought that what was really interesting is that you boiled down a lot of the tasks of manager into quantifiable objectives and then measuring those objectives and communicating them with the team. And I think that sometimes people get put into the role of management when they're good at the job, but they're Mm -hmm. not good at being managers. In other words, you're a great participant on your team. You're a great salesperson. You're a great this. I'll make you the manager. Mm -hmm. Why is that a mistake? It's a mistake because as a manager, your job isn't to be the best at all of those things. It's helpful maybe because maybe you know the job well, you know how to hire for it. You're someone people look up to. So certainly there are some pros. But at the end of the day, the job of management is not to do the craft of the thing that you were hired for, whether it's sales, design, engineering, so forth. The actual job is to get a group of people together and ensure that they can do their very best work while working together. You know, it's taking the strengths of every individual and ensuring that the output results in something far better than anybody could have done on their own. And you draw a distinction between leadership and management. And I found this to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. As you say, a manager, I always think of the manager as the coach of the team. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you're not on the court. You're not on the field. Mm -hmm. But you got to make that team come together and win. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I think leadership probably is more of the the big owner, general manager. Like what is the ethos of this team? How do you define leadership versus management? The difference to me is that leadership is a quality and it's something that many people can possess or demonstrate in particular situations. Back to your team analogy. 
you know, the star player might be a leader. Mm -hmm. He's someone that mentors other people, that gives them, you know, pep talks in the locker room and that, you know, helps the whole team get better. That person is a leader as well. A manager should be a leader, should be seen as a leader in order to be successful. But management is a role. Mm. It's like being a heart surgeon or being a teacher, right? It can be given to you. It can be taken away from you. Whereas leadership is something you have to earn. You know, if people don't want to follow you, then you're not successfully being a leader. Do you feel like you have both of those aspects? Uh, I like to think so. All yes. right. That's good. You could say, yes, I do. Damn it. You talk about the strange role that is being asked of you to manage people who used to be your peers. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. I think a lot of people can relate to how strange that can be. Mm -hmm. That, you know, all of a sudden I go from being drinking buddies out mm -hmm. of the office with a bunch of people that I have a really good time with, and now I'm the manager. What did that feel like for you? Awkward. <laughs> Definitely awkward because, you know, again, one day we're just trading tips on design. We're, we're joking about things. And the next day I'm sitting with this person being like, great, let's have a formal one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, and the person is looking at me like, you're not a better designer than me, which is true. And, and you know, clearly you haven't been doing the job, so it's not like you're experienced. Mm. So what do you have to really offer me, right? Why why would this be a good situation? So How I did you win these that. people over? The most important thing that I learned is that I didn't need to feel so awkward about it because, again, I'm, I, don't, I didn't need to be a better designer than this person. That's not what I was asked to do. I just needed to be there to be helpful to this person, mm -hmm. right, to understand, you know, what are, what are your aspirations? You know, what do you think you're great at? What do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? What do you think about our team? What's going well? What's not going well? I just needed to start that conversation with the person and I needed to then take those answers and use that to help that person and help the team. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I felt if I had gone and told myself, hey, you don't have to prove yourself as somehow better in certain aspects or skills than the people on your team. You just have to be there and say, look, I want to be helpful. So tell me how to do that. The first place to start is I want to understand a lot more about you and what you want and what you care about. That would have been such a lower pressure way to, mm -hmm. I think, get started on that conversation. Mm. It's hard. And I think it's hard for the team members also, because in many ways, some of those team members, on they don't want your job, but they're mad that you got it anyway, right? Or not mad, but maybe questioning why you got that anyway. Mm -hmm. So you do hire, hiring and <clears throat> firing, mm -hmm. which is never, I hated that. I owned a company for a while and I was just like the worst at firing. I always just felt so bad and I think that I knew in my heart I was doing the right thing kind of like when you do when you're breaking up with somebody mm -hmm. it's like it yeah, is you, not yeah. it's not easy but you're sort of saying like I'm not in love with you anymore and you certainly don't want to be with, with someone, someone who's someone not who in love right. with you right? right and so how did you handle the the firing first and then we'll talk about your approach to hiring as well firing is hard there's yeah. no way around it yeah. and and I think anytime you have to tell someone news that's disappointing to them, that's hard. Hmm. You know, whether it's, hey, you know, I had this one exciting job and six people wanted it and not, you know, I'm, I'm picking someone else, not you, right? right? Like giving that kind of feedback is hard because you know that the person is going to be disappointed. Hmm. But I, what you said about breaking up really resonates with me because at the end of the day, it's better to be honest with someone. It's better to let them know if you think this isn't a good fit. Could be that what that person aspires to do and really gets them excited and motivated is not this job. It doesn't mean they don't have the skills for it. It doesn't mean they somehow, you know, couldn't be successful doing something else. It's just, again, it's not a good fit. So let's talk a little bit about hiring, which, you know, I imagine it's incredibly competitive, especially as the company was growing to get in the door. What was it that a candidate did that would stand out for you? What, what made you open your eyes and be like, wow, I need that person. What What do you think those qualities were? I mean, presuming that everyone has the right resume, mm -hmm. like so they're in the box. Mm -hmm. What makes someone stand out to you? For me, it was someone who demonstrated that they really, really wanted to learn and that they were uh, extremely introspective and reflective and just kind of obsessed with growing as a person. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite questions to ask is, you know, I'll say, Jill, tell me about a challenge that you encounter and something that was really hard for you over the last six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And you describe that to me, you describe the problem. 
And then I'd say, well, if you could go back in time and do that all over again, what would you have done differently? And the candidates who are like, well, you know, I couldn't have done anything. It was this circumstance, that circumstance, that person, you know, that made it so hard. Mm -hmm. Then I'm usually like, "Mm, maybe that's a red flag. Yeah. But it's interesting to ask that question because, as you said, it requires some self-reflection and thoughtfulness about, you know, really, what would I have done? So let me ask you that question over the last year. What did you find super challenging? Tell us a little bit about what that was. I found it really challenging to balance having my regular job with doing the book. In retrospect, I think I could have done a much better job of, of the time management, of you know creating boundaries, uh, setting aside, hey, here's my period where I'm going to be focused on this one thing, and then here's that other bucket where mm-hmm. I'm going to be focused on that. I think I let it blend in a little bit too much, and that just created a little bit more stress for me all around. All right. So let's talk about, you know, Facebook being thrust in the news. I, you don't have to speak for the whole organization. I know that I don't want to put you on the spot because you you aren't, you know, the person necessarily making decisions. So I am confronted with this notion uh, sitting here in the CBS News Broadcast Center that I am part of a media organization. Mm-hmm. And it strikes those of us in the world of these organizations that Facebook kind of has a free pass because you feel like, well, you're putting news out there, but you're not responsible for what goes out. So what's the company mantra on that? And what is your view on that? I would direct you to a lot of the notes that Mark Zuckerberg has written about this topic, about Facebook's responsibility. You know, I think one of the really important points we've tried to make and Uh, that we're uh, moving forward with in a lot of our product plans is taking a lot more accountability and responsibility for the things that happen in our platform. You know, we believe it's a way for people to express their voice. And when that happens, a lot of good happens. You know, tons of people are connected all over the world. You're able to find, you know, your group, your tribe, your people who can, you know, support you in hard times, whether you're a single mother or whether you're someone who's trying to, you know, run a marathon for the first time. But also when you put, you know, people's voices on a platform, bad things happen too. And I think we have to acknowledge both of those. Our job is to amplify the good and to diminish the bad. What do you think as a manager Mark Zuckerberg did wrong in this process? This is so bad that I'm going to like you're his employee. So I don't know if you're going to be able to speak freely. So do you have thoughts on that? I will just say that one of the things that has been really important for me, really valuable for me, and why I've stayed at Facebook for so long is I really, really believe in the mission. I believe in the mission of the company. I believe in the mission of connecting people. And we have a lot of work to do. You know, we do. Yeah, I mean, because it feels to a lot of us that, you know, you had all of this, uh, yeah, we see the positive, but look, my training is as, as a trader, which would be as if I approached my job when I first started as, yeah, I could make millions of dollars every single year, which is true, but I could also lose millions of dollars. It seemed to me that there was no view on the downside of what was being created. And now the question is, How quickly can you clean up the downside and address the downside? You know, there's a part of me that feels a little bit like I did with Boeing. Boeing's right in the news, right? You have this airplane that's crashed. And they're like, no, 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 no. It's not. You kind of want there to be a big ass time out. And I know this would be probably impossible. But what I kind of felt like is after all the information became clear, Facebook could have just literally said, we're going dark till we fix this problem. There's got to be a way with all those people who are so smart and just hire more people, make less money for your investors, but be more responsible. I'm worried that you have a CEO has no accountability. He can't be fired. He has voting shares and he has a board that is sycophantic at best and irresponsible at worst. So that does not seem like a good management structure to me. At the end of the day, you know, Facebook is uh, going to live or die in the market based on its value to people. And I think if, you know, over time we don't make progress on a lot of these problems that are extremely important then I think that over time, you know, people will hold us accountable. When you look at management decisions in crisis, what do you think a manager's role is when there's a crisis? I think it's important to dig deep and understand what are your values, you know, what really matters. You're going to have people who disagree with you. You're going to have 
people who tell you things um, from all different angles, who pull you in all different directions. I think it's important to dig deep and, and say, what do we really stand for? What is the purpose of our team? You know, it's in those moments when purpose matters uh, so much, when you have to be able to tell your team, hey, there's lots of different ways that we can view success. Here is what we think success looks like. You know, and here is what we think failure looks like. And people need to be able to have basically it's like the orchestra having the exact same sheet music. You know, mm-hmm. they have to be unified in that purpose so that they can do their best work. Do you think that your purpose can change over time? I think most organizations are founded on some mission and some longstanding belief. And usually that tends to stay pretty constant. I think it would be difficult if, you know, a, a company came in and they did one thing, and, unless it was failing, unless, yeah. you know, there was real need to pivot. Uh, I think it, it it's sort of like being a person, you know, if like your values are kind of constantly changing. I think people maybe um, tend to be a little bit more skeptical of you or, or see you less. However, I think that's different than are you an organization or a person who learns from your mistakes? And I think that is a very, very important quality to have because maybe some of the ways that you were doing things, maybe some of the the uh, facts of the world that you took for granted turned out to be actually they're not true. Or maybe, you know, there's a new learning that, that right. we Right. I mean, look, you could be a doctor and say, I'm seeking a cure, but you also start from the premise of do no harm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering if Facebook as an organization is going to have to reconcile itself with the fact that do no harm is going to come with a price. That's just the deal. And, you know, ask any big bank on Wall Street that, right? You know, the first thing we learn from the financial crisis is, oh, by the way, don't lever up your bets and quadruple down on it and put the public's money at risk. And so they learned that lesson. I think it's going to be an interesting time. I really do. I think that there's a ton of regulation that's going to come not just from the European Union, but now from the U.S. And it's going to be interesting to see how Facebook navigates that. But I wonder how that's going to impact your view of the company as someone who's been there for so long now, more than a decade, how you see your role in an, in an evolving company. I tell people, you know, especially at a company that's been scaling so rapidly, it has felt like I've had a different job every single year. Mm-hmm. And that's both a great thing and it's both a terrifying thing because it means that every year you're faced with problems of the scale and magnitude that you haven't seen before. And um, and every year, you know, I think the question for me is always, do I believe in the mission? Do I believe in the people that I work with? And if so, how am I going to help myself learn? How am I going to help myself get into that mentality where I can help my team tackle the biggest problems that we have ahead? So where is a designer likely to get pushback from? So in editorial, right, I can go pitch a story and I can get pushback from the senior executive producers, right? And conversely, they can come to me with a story. It's happened yesterday. And I like, I think that story's BS. I don't think we should do this. And here's why. So we have natural but healthy conflict. Where do you reach that point when you're a designer? Who is the, who's the other side of the pushback? And, you know, when we build any product, what's important for us is looking at a variety of signals to try and help us understand what it is that people want. I think one of the mistakes that designers can make is designing for themselves. You know, it's right. like, taking, like oh, this too is much, cool. taking too much of your own intuition. You know, I go back to one of the, the earliest mistakes um, that I still think about pretty much every week uh, when we tried to do this huge redesign. You know, we uh, the design team spent six months putting together uh, what we thought was the most incredible redesign ever of the Facebook website. And this, this was a couple of years ago. This is when, you know, we were still dealing with websites rather than mobile apps. Um, and we were convinced in, that everything about this was better because we were taking your photos. We were making them much more immersive. We were, um, you know, leaning into the trend that mobile phones and digital photos were getting better. And, you know, Previously, Facebook was extremely text-based, and now we were getting to this visual and immersive medium, and so we wanted the website to reflect that. Um, so we poured a lot of our heart and soul into this you know, design. We'd all been using it internally for months and months, and we loved it. We we're so excited to put it out in the world, and everyone hated it. Why did they hate it? 
Well, we first got a lot of complaints, and you know, well, because obviously, first of all, any change you're going to get complaints. Yes, and so that, that that was what we thought. We thought, wow, you know, people are so used to the old thing right. that they haven't adjusted right. to this new thing, and I'll you know, get it's it. just, yeah. And we'll just wait. You know, we'll wait a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and soon we'll have the letters pouring in that tell us how much they love our new design. But then we were able to look at basically everything that measured whether or not this was a better design. Uh-huh. Right, so. For example, how often did people come and, and how often were they, you know, interacting with other uh, their friends and other users? How often were they sharing? How often were they navigating and, and clicking to other places? Because we thought we'd done a much better job right. making navigation clear. And so if that's true, then you'll see people exploring other parts of the site more, right? All of that, you know, we can measure in terms of like where they're clicking and, and all of that. So we take a look at all of these numbers, these metrics that we'd collected. Everything was worse. Really? Did you revert to the other design immediately? No, we were, I, we, I was deeply unsatisfied with that. I was like, I'm sure <laughs> there must be a logging bug because, yes, again, of our course. intuition was so strong, right? There must be something, uh, there must be a mistake. Like, we're not, you know, we're not measuring things properly. You know, I, I was like, until we know what the actual reason was, mm. this is not a satisfying. Way. You didn't like the one that was just, we hate this. That was a bad one. Okay. Well, it was like, if you hate it, why? What What about it? You know, other than that it's different. Okay. You know, because, again, we do get used to differences right. over time. And so we ended up having to deconstruct the entire experiment. We had changed 20 things. We started to tease apart. Okay, is it, was it the fact that we made the photos bigger? Was it the fact that we changed navigation? Was it the fact that we, you know, uh, rearranged the order right, of the Right, because there were too many for... variables to really figure this out. Right. And so we had to go back and we had to try and, and isolate each variable and run, you know, that, that test and go and talk to people and say, was it this thing? Is this the thing that, that made you, you know, uh, uh, like Facebook less or use Facebook less? You know what we found out? What? That ultimately, this design worked really, really well for people who had big screens and who had the latest and greatest hardware technology, which again was all of us at the company. But the vast majority of the millions and billions who were using it, not so much. Yes. And all all the people who were using it, you know, again, on a third generation laptop, right, you know, 800 by 600 resolution at the time. Our stories were so big, they couldn't even fit on, the entirety of the story couldn't even fit on the screen. That's wild. And it's cool that you figured out the why and then were able to design around that. Yes. And once we figured out the why, it was much easier to know what to do with it. Because otherwise we would have just, again, been experimenting, would have been throwing things at the wall, you know, would have been like, is this working? Is this not? But once we figured that out, then we were able to say, you know what? We like this design. We thought it was better. But... The world at large. This is not better for the majority of people out there. And so we need to take that lesson and we need to do something different. And it really taught me a lot about designing for empathy, designing for people who aren't you. The importance of going out there and talking to your customers and, and talking to, you know, the people who use your products all over the world and just coming to the point where, you know, it's you can't build things always by intuition. You can in the beginning. Again, it was a college site. We were building right. for college people. We had a good sense of what college people wanted, what they would use. But as our user base scaled, it was a lot more important for us to be able to go in there with that sense of, uh, of beginner's mindset. Three bits of advice for someone who's just been named a new manager. What's the three best things you should keep in mind? The first thing is ask for feedback. Ask for feedback all the time. It's the thing that you can do that is going to help you learn the fastest. Okay, next. Next, give feedback all the time. You know, I've read thousands of upward reviews of people, um, you know, about their managers. Number one thing that people say, I wish my manager gave me more feedback. Hmm. And feedback doesn't have to be negative. You don't have to just give it if something is wrong or, or not going well. Feedback that is positive, that reinforces what someone is doing well, that says, here are your strengths and here's how, you know, you can take those strengths and and do more with them. That is equally, if not more valuable for someone to hear. Feedback, feedback, and number three? Number three, don't be afraid to admit that you don't know the answers. I see a lot of new managers who feel like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm thrust into this position, I have to pretend like I know everything, that I'm this authoritative figure who's got it all figured out. And that just creates distance between you and your report. Because if you act that way, 
your report's going to act that way too. They're going to assume that they need to be all buttoned up for you and you're going to miss you know, the, the moments where you can truly help someone because they're open and honest with you about what they want help with or what isn't going well. Okay, before we let you go, we want to ask the bookend question to our first question. I said, what was the best career or financial decision? You said joining Facebook in 2006. <laughs> What's the worst? What's my worst financial decision? I made a couple of poor investments, uh, probably buying a timeshare in Las Vegas. Is oh, the my worst. God. You know, that's my mother-in-law's favorite quote, like in our family. <laughs> She's 95 now. But she, she said, I think it was just like 25 years ago, my brother-in-law was like, we bought a timeshare. And she turned around and looked up and said, timeshares are for suckers. Mm-hmm. And they kind of are, right? Yeah, and they are. All yeah. right. That's and not a bad a sucker. one. That's not a bad one. Julie Zhu, the author of The Making of a Manager. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Thanks to Julie Zhu, and thanks to you for listening. We drop new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. You can download this show anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Google Play, Radio.com, or Stitcher. If you would like to ask us a financial question or a career question or any question that is on your mind, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio is our executive producer. And if you have any questions about anything we do, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. There you can buy my new book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. We're distributed by Cadence 13. See you next week. 